is how the world seemed back when I was 19. Maybe I just miss having things all figured out. Cause now I got doubts and I got these questions. Things I just don't understand. But I bet you'll sort it out. It's been too long since we sat down and talked this way. Life is hard, sometimes I don't know what to say. There are times when it just doesn't make no sense. But you have been good to me, you have been good to me time and again. So thank you.
Sometimes on this journey, I get lost in my mistakes. What looks to me like weakness is a canvas for your strength. And my story isn't over, my story's just begun. And fail, you won't define me, cause that's what my father does. Yeah, fail, you won't define me, cause that's what my father does. Good morning, church. All right, I feel like it's a time change again this week. I don't know what's going on. Let's stand up together, church family, because that word is in this song, so we must stand. We are standing on the promises. Let's worship. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, and through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. And standing on the promises that cannot fail. When the howling storms of doubt and fear assail, by the living word of God I shall prevail. Standing on the promises of God, oh, stand, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises of Christ the Lord, bound to Him eternally by love's strong cord, overcoming daily with the Spirit's sword, standing on the promises of God, oh, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing. I'm standing, I'm standing on the promises of God, 
And standing on the promises I cannot fall Listening every moment to the Spirit's call Resting in my Savior as my all in all Standing on the promises of God oh, oh, I'm standing, standing Standing on the promises of God my Savior Standing, standing I'm standing on the promises of God Yeah, you can have a seat, church. Good morning, everybody. We're glad you're here. My name is Michelle Betts, and I work with the children's ministry here. I do think a lot of people might be coming to the second hour briefing because you know why. I'll talk about that in a minute. All right, so if you are new to us and are looking for those attendance cards we used to have, those are called connection cards, and you can find them if you click on this link to go to our online bulletin, and you can let us know you're here, and you can also find out all the things that are going on at Highland for the next few weeks. And this week in particular, there's a lot going on, so you'll want to check on that. If you're new to Highland, too, or if you've never been to our church or this fellowship, then we do the Lord's Supper every week. And today we're going to do it at a little different time, but we still encourage you to go get those packets that are back by the doors or up here and have them with you for that time of communion. We want to thank you every week for your generosity and your giving And the way that you bless us here with your funds, that we can do ministry. And one of the ways I'm particularly always thankful for is for the children's ministry. And I want to ask you if you've seen any of these little Jesus statues around the building. But this Wednesday night, our first through fifth graders hid these little Jesuses all over the place. Like I found one in a printer. I don't think we approve printer. But anyway, there's little Jesuses. And what we've told them is we're going to tell y'all if you see a baby, not a baby Jesus, full, full-size full Jesus, just little tiny Jesus, if you see him, you need to pick him up and hold on to him and think about this week, first of all. But then also, we want you to pray for the children's ministry. We want God to increase it. We want those rooms to be full. We are ready to double each classroom. And we are ready to do that. And so if you, see a little, if you see one of these Jesuses, you grab him, hold on to him, pray, and then pray for the children's ministry. So today... We have Easter extravaganza. It's a big day for our kiddos, but it's a big day for our neighbors and your neighbors who you're bringing. And so we want to be friendly and we want to be uh, accept them into this group of crazy people we have here, these broken, imperfection, imperfect people that can know about Jesus here. And we want to include them in that. So if you see somebody today at this event that you don't know, introduce yourself. And they might say, we've been here 10 years. That's okay. You hadn't met them till today. So meet those people. We're excited about it. We're setting up now. We are doing a little bit different. We don't want you stepping on an egg. So we're making a little boundary around our egg stations. But you can definitely come eat a hot dog, put a blanket down. We're even laying out some blankets for you all to have your hot dog and your chips. They're free for you when you come out of here at, at the second service. If any of you want to just hang around and help, we're going to be setting up more during that second hour of worship. So we're excited to be here. But one more exciting thing. As we go into worship, we have a new person joining our staff. We are so excited about that. Emily Cohorn will be joining us, and we're going to have a video showing a little bit, and then Sean Gerson's going to come up and introduce her to y'all. Hey, church family, we are so excited about today because today is the day that we get to add a new member to our youth ministry team. And when we started this process months ago, we weren't sure how it would play out or when it would play out, but a lot of people have been praying. And as always, the Lord provides. And we're so thankful for those prayers. And as a result of that, today is an answered prayer. This is Emily Cohorn, and you're probably seeing her name pop up on the screen. And no, I did say it right. It is pronounced Cohorn, but spelled Cochran. But we are so excited to have Emily join us here at HYG and the blessing that she's gonna be to our ministry. Hi everyone, I am Emily Cohorn and I am so excited to be here with you guys. I can't wait to meet and know all of you so soon. Um, I came from Edmond, Oklahoma originally and I went to Oklahoma Christian University. And after that, I went to Arkansas and did three years of youth ministry there. And I'm so excited that God led me to be here at Highland with you. Um, I can't wait to get started and join the HYG team.
Good morning, church. It's a great day. We're super excited to have Emily with us now, and uh, just what a what a blessing we have at Highland to have people like her here. Been amazing staff, and she's going to be in addition to it. Emily, I want you to know that we are committed to praying for you. We love you. We're going to support you, and this church is just going to be blessed by your ministry. So I am going to charge you now, okay? Um, <clears throat> I'm going to try to do it without my glasses on. Oh, by the way, I'm, my name is Sean Prine, not Sean Gearson. There's a, his, he's here too. <clears throat> Emily, I charge you as a minister of the gospel, and specifically as a Highland Youth Minister, to be faithful. I charge you to live out the gospel with your words and your deeds. I charge you to be a godly woman, to be a student of Scripture, to be a woman of prayer, to be led by the Holy Spirit. I charge you to teach the truth, be available and love and support students and their families. I charge you to be a spiritual leader for your church and our city. And I charge you to keep the main thing, the main thing, by submitting all things to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Do you accept this charge? Yes, I do. I'm so excited about that. Y'all, let's pray for Emily, okay? Father, we're just so grateful for the many, many great things you do for us here at this church. And for, will you bless us? Will you bless us with amazing people who work here. We're especially thankful today for Emily. We pray that um, we be a great support to her, that she be extremely faithful, and uh, that her, her, her ministry is just spirit-led and that it is fruitful. Father, we pray all these things in your name. All right, I'm excited. Emily, a little bird, you told me that you sing, so next week, right there. Are you good? Okay, cool. She's going to be next week on Easter. No, I'm kidding. But I'm so thankful. Let's stand up, church. Let's worship God. Let's continue this good, good stuff. Here we go. He is the Lord, and he reigns on high. He is the Lord, spoken to When we call on his name, he is Lord. Show your power, oh Lord, our God. And show your power, oh Lord, our God. Oh Lord, our God. Your gospel, oh Lord, is the hope for you my lord it's the power of god for our salvation you are the lord we ask not for riches but look to the cross you are the lord and for our inheritance give us the lost you are the lord Show your power, oh Lord, our God. And show your power, oh Lord, our God. Oh, send your power, oh, send your power, oh Lord, our God. Send your power. Singing, oh, precious is the 
For my part and this I see Nothing but the blood of Jesus oh, oh, and For my cleansing this I see Nothing but the blood of Jesus Singing no precious is the blood That makes me white as snow No Nothing but the blood of Jesus And nothing can for sin atone Nothing but the blood of Jesus oh, 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 Not a good that I have done Nothing but the blood of Jesus Oh, 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 oh precious is the blood never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. And it's higher than the mountains that I face. And it's stronger than the power of the grave. And it's constant in the trial and change this one thing remember I know this one thing does it remain your love never fails it never gives up it never runs out on me your love never fails it never gives up it never runs out on me your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love, and your love, and on and on and on and on it goes. Yes, it overwhelms and satisfies my soul, and I never ever have to be afraid this one thing remains your love never fails it never gives up it never runs out on me your love never fails it never gives up it never runs out on me no your love never fails it never gives up it never runs out on me your love, yes, your love, I love these words. In death, in life, I'm confident and covered by the power of your great love. I, my death is paid, there's nothing that can separate my heart from your Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. I know your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Oh, your, your love never fails, it never gives up. It never runs out on me. Oh, your love never fails. It never gives up. It never runs out on me. This one thing remains. I know this one thing remains. Church, you can have a seat. 
God, we love you. We thank you for this time. and We sing about your love. And God, we are here because we love you. And we are grateful for uh, you, God, Christ, our Savior, and the spirit that is in this place and in us. And uh, we take this moment because we are all here together to say that we love you, Jesus. We love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. My Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine. For good thing I have a big voice. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he had to go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders, chief priests, and legal experts, and that he had to be killed and raised on the third day. Then Peter took a hold of Jesus and, scolding him, began to correct him. God forbid this, Lord. This won't happen to you. But he turned to Peter and he said, get behind me, Satan. You are a stone that could make me stumble. For you were not thinking of God's thoughts, but on human thoughts. Jesus said to his disciples, all who want to come after me must say no to themselves, take up their cross and follow me. All who want to save their lives will lose them. But all those who lose their lives because of me will find them. Why would people gain the whole world but lose their lives? What will people give in exchange for their lives? Ah, 
Church family. Yeah, thank you. You can just throw it right down there. We're going to do a, a new song today, hopefully one that you've heard, if you listen to any worship music or Christian music. And um, actually, this will be, remember when we used to use books, this, we're gonna, you're going to see some notes up here. And so, promise me, you're all going to follow along. Just raise your hand. No, I'm just kidding. And I love this song. I love the words. We pray to God the Father. He's the God of, of Abraham, and Jacob, and Isaac, and David. And, and he's just so many that have gone on before us. What a big and powerful and wonderful God that we serve. Let's sing about him right now. I'm calling on the God of Jacob, whose love endures to generations. I know that you will keep your covenant. I'm calling on the God of Moses, the one who opened up the ocean. You now to do the same thing for me. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. Oh rock, oh rock of ages, I'm standing on your faithfulness. On your faithfulness. favor rests upon the lowly. I know with you all things are possible. I'm calling on the God of David, who made a shepherd boy courageous. I may not face Goliath, but I've got my own giants. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. Oh rock, oh rock of ages, I'm standing on your faithfulness. On your faithfulness. You heard your children and you hear your children. You are the same God, you are the same God. You answered prayers back then, and you will answer now. You are the same God, you are the same God. You were providing then, you are providing now. You are the same God, you are the same God. You moved in power then, God moved in power now. You are the same God, you are the same God. You were a healer then, you are a healer now. You are the same God, you are the same God. You were a Savior then, you are a Savior now. You are the same God, you are the same God. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. Oh rock, oh rock of ages, I'm standing on your faithfulness. On your faithfulness. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. Oh rock, oh rock of ages, I'm standing on your faithfulness. On your Oh. 
time together this morning and for the series that we're in right now what a what an amazing thank you man told him to bring this table I wanted to feel like Eric so that it's like three people laughing so but um I'm just thankful for this table that we get to gather around that we are all part of through our birth into Jesus Christ through our baptism into eternal life, through our immersion into God's everlasting, unwavering uh, love that is, is just almost hard for, it's hard for me to comprehend how he would love someone like me the way that he does. But I'm so thankful for this time and hope you've got your, your bread and your cup. I'm going to pray then we'll commune together, and uh, let's just focus on his blood, that blood that makes us part of his family. Lord, I pray that the truth that has been entrusted to us and the lessons we have learned will not be hidden from the next generation. Would you grant us every grace we need to make known to our children, even the children yet unborn, the path that leads to life. May our children and our families live as sojourners who desire you and all that you have promised. More than they desire money, more than they desire physical touch, more than power, more than popularity, more than anything else. Give them faith to be strong and faith to be weak. Faith to be married and faith to be single. Faith to have children and faith to be childless. Faith to be wealthy and faith to be poor. Give them faith that can stand even when crisis comes and when tragedy strikes. May they never lose sight of the reality that you are better than what life can give them now and better than what death can take from them later. Amen. May our hunger for the superior worth of our glorious God lead us every time we are together to this table to share a meal, young and old, rich and poor, so that we can have strength to run the race you have set before us, holding firm in confidence until that day 
when your kingdom comes in all its glory and truth once and for all triumphs over sin and death and mourning and tears and all that hinders the everlasting joy that is ours through Jesus Christ, your son. We take this communion in your name, Jesus. Wash me clean in the warm sun, dry me. Again, this is Emma Johnson. She shared with me that the Lord's been working on her heart for a while, and she felt like he'd been calling to her, and that today when she heard his voice, she knew it was the time. I've asked her about her own heart and readiness for this, and she's, she's declared to me that she knows that she's a sinner and that only Jesus can save her. Uh, when Jesus is baptized, the Lord looks down on him and he says, This is my son, whom I love, and in him I'm well pleased. And we believe that today the Lord looks at you and says, This is my daughter, whom I love, and in her I'm well pleased. Okay, so Emma, do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? I do. Okay. It's based on that confession. I'm going to baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, for the forgiveness of your sins the gift of the Holy Spirit so that you might be saved now and forever. <laughs> hey, congratulations. It's so happy for you. Here's Emma. Uh, Emma, I hope that you're watching. Emma's a college student who was here from out of town last week and decided to give her life to Jesus in baptism. We actually had another group of college students who were staying here last week, and one of those young men decided to be baptized here as well. We don't have video footage of that. We're celebrating two uh, new lives in Christ this week. We are praying as a church for baptisms for those who would give their life to Jesus in this water, and I ask that you would join me in that prayer, and we're talking about that today. This is the beginning of what we call Holy Week in the broader Christian calendar. It's when we think about the death of Jesus and then his resurrection next Sunday on Easter. And so today, as we talk about baptism, we're going to talk about that dimension of it, the death or blood of Christ Jesus. That's where we're going. So to help with that, why don't you, if you've got a Bible, take it out and turn to Titus. Titus chapter 3, this is one of the verses we've been working to memorize as a church this year. We're going to do a deep dive on this passage together today. But before we do that, a couple announcements. Uh, today is a huge day, the start of our Easter week here at Highland. We've got the Easter extravaganza happening right after late service, right out there in front. We're going to feed you lunch. It's hot dogs and drinks and stuff that will be out there right after late service. So if you want to stick around and even help us to set up during late service, I guarantee if you walk out there and say, can I help? The answer will be yes. Okay, so we would love for you to do that or just stick around and eat lunch with us and go hunt some Easter eggs with the kiddos. Tuesday of this week, we've got hymns with Jim that happens during the day, followed by a lunch. Wednesday night, we've got the night of praise with Brescia and the Levy Band. Our teenagers are going to be part of that. You won't want to miss it. And then next week is Easter week. I really want to encourage you, challenge you to bring a friend to come and be part of that next week. I think that they'll be blessed by being here. Hey, in the back, or actually at each of the entrances back there, but also the entrances up here, we've got this little booklet. I'm, I'm calling it the Gospel Guidebook. And uh, I called it that. Russ asked me what to say on the screen, and I realized technically the Gospel Guidebook already exists. It's called the Bible. But I don't mean to replace that, but uh, I set out to design a little guide for families to use during Easter week with their kids, thinking about my own kids. And I tried to do it using the five memory verses that we're memorizing as a church this year. And it kind of grew and morphed into something that I think you could do with your kids, but that I also think you could just do with anybody. And so these are available uh, at all the entrances. So why don't you grab one of these? I think they would be especially useful for you this week. So let me encourage you to pick one of those up. And then last bit of announcements before we jump into God's word that for the last year, the leaders here at Highland have been praying and fasting and discerning together about our next elders. And then about six months ago, you all as a church submitted nominations. 
And then over those nominees, our elders continued to pray and to fast and discern. And today, I'm excited to announce the eight nominees that your elders are putting forward for your final approval and affirmation. And so let me read their names, and as I do, what I'd say is our, our request is that you would pray over each one of these men and their wives. If you had a biblical concern about one of these, that you would bring it to myself or one of our elders before April 14th, okay? Otherwise, we will affirm them publicly on April 21st. Let me share these names with you. I'm excited about these guys and their wives. All right, Jimmy Adkins, that's one of those. Jay Bethay, Carrie Daniel. Charlie Fowler, Jonathan Mooneyham, Rance Reagan, Rod Robinson, and Trent Williamson. Okay. So I thank God for these men and their wonderful wives, and I'd ask you to do the same and to pray over them over the next month as they prepare for this great task. Okay, so many announcements. Let's jump into God's Word together. Let me pray for us. God, I give you great praise and thanks for what you have done for us in Christ Jesus. Would you, through your word, make that more clear to us today so that our love for you would grow and abound? I pray this in the name of Christ Jesus. Amen. Maybe you heard this on the radio this week. I heard it, and I, I followed up and checked the article to make sure this was true. How many of you shop at Costco? Anybody ever go to Costco? All right. Costco has a little cafe where you can get this combo. It's a hot dog and a soda for $1.50. So you can feed your whole family for like six bucks at Costco. Has anybody ever had the combo, the hot dog soda combo? Okay, all right, some of you had that. That combo has been $1.50 longer than I have been alive. It's been $1.50 since Ronald Reagan was president of the United States, okay? And it's kind of like Costco's thing that they have refused to change the price of that in large part because of their CFO. He has defended it for years. In fact, at a recent shareholders meeting, he was asked whether they should increase the cost. And he said he felt like he had been struck by lightning when he was asked that. He was so offended by it. Okay, but he's retiring. He's retiring. So Bloomberg asked him, they said, hey, is the $1.50 combo safe? And this was his answer. This is what he said. He said, it's probably safe for a while. Okay, and I was thinking about that, and it occurred to me that there's two parts of that short phrase that we don't like, probably and for a while, right? Okay, what we wish he had just said was it's safe, right? That's what we wish he had said, and cut probably and for a while. Right? Okay, so the reason I tell you that story is one, to get you ready for lunch today. We're having hot dogs, all right? But two, I've been thinking a lot about that, and I've been thinking about our own lives in Christ, and specifically what it means to be saved. And when I was younger and first come to understand my salvation, I think I thought about salvation primarily as safety, safety with Christ now and forever. And probably as I've grown in the faith, I hope that my picture of salvation has shifted from one of being safe to one of feeling joy a life of peace and joy in Christ that satisfies my heart's desires in a way that's, that nothing else does. But what I realize, and this is easy to forget, is that I feel joy because I first feel safe. If I didn't feel safe in Christ, the likelihood that I would feel joy is probably pretty small, right? And I don't mean that um, I'd feel like nothing's ever going to happen to me, safe in that sense. That's not what I mean. What I mean is because I belong to Christ, I feel that whatever happens to me, I'm okay. That in life or in death, I belong to him. He's got me. I'm his. I'm good. Okay. And that feeling of safety, I think, is what we all desire maybe more than anything else. In this life and the next, I want to know that I'm good. So this passage here in Titus, come here with me. That's exactly what it's talking about. Let me read this to you, and then we're, we're like I said, going to do a deep dive into this passage to try to see what it tells us, because what it tells us is really helpful to know. All right. Look at this. When the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. 
not because of righteous things that we had done, we talked about that last week, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, pay attention here, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. Okay, look at that last phrase. Leave this up on the screen there if you don't mind for just a minute. Look at the very last phrase here, having the hope of eternal life. So he says, based on everything Christ Jesus has done for us, the end result of that is the last phrase in the sentence. What is it? The hope of eternal life. Now, to understand this biblically, you got to remember that when we're talking about Scripture, hope does not mean what you and I say it means in our daily usage of it. It doesn't mean like, I hope this will happen. Maybe that would happen. That would be great if it happened. Biblically, hope means confident. I am sure this will happen. So what's he saying? Because of all that Christ Jesus has done, the result of that is that I feel confident I am safe now and forever. That's what he's saying. All right. How do you get that confidence? Well, here's what we're going to do. Take one step back from that last phrase in the sentence. We become heirs having the hope of eternal life. How? One step back, having been justified by his grace. You see that? All right. Having been justified by his grace. Throw that next slide up there, Russ, so we can just emphasize that. The justification that I receive by the grace of Jesus is what makes me feel and know I'm safe in him. All right. Justified is not a word that we use a lot, okay? Um, It's just not a word in our common language language. And so the other day, I told this story a few months ago in our Acts series. We talked about justification. I told a story of how I tried to explain justification to my kids over our morning Bible study that we do. So they're eating Fruit Loops or something, and I'm trying to get their attention. I'm like, guys, let's talk about justification. And they're just like, okay, they, they, okay. so we got to go at it a different, a different way. All right. So I asked them, I say, boys, there's a God, right? Yeah, daddy. Yeah, daddy. There's a God. And God made you, right? Yeah, he made us. We've talked about that. He made us for sure. Okay. Because there's a God and he made you, he gets to determine what happens to you in this life and the next life, right? Yeah, God, I guess. Or yeah, Dad, that that makes sense. They don't call me God. They call me Dad. And um, (laughs) they're like, yeah, Dad, that makes sense. Yeah, he gets to determine what happens to me in life and death if he made me. Okay, so then here's the question. If there's a God who made you, who will determine what happens to you in this life and the next one, the most important question you can ever ask is, what does that God think of you? What does he think of you? And our tendency is to say, I'm a pretty good guy. He probably thinks I'm pretty good. Jesus says the reason that we think that is that we are self-justifiers. That's what Jesus says, self-justifiers. When in reality, like Paul tells us in Romans 3, that God has a standard, it is way up here, and all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. We don't meet the standard. But then he says in the very next phrase, Romans 3.24, that we, though we have fallen short of the glory of God, are justified. Okay, so brought up to the standard that he requires by the redemption that comes to us through Christ Jesus. So that's what justified means. Justified means to be good in God's eyes, for him to look at me and see me as good. So the question is, how am I justified by Jesus Christ? And there's one Bible answer, the blood of Christ. That's it. So look with me at Romans 8. Sorry, Romans 5, verse 8. But God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Look at this. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. So the Bible's really clear on this. You and I are not good in God's eyes, but through the blood of Christ, we are made good in God's eyes. 
How does that work? Let me try to explain that briefly. Since the beginning of time, humans have been trying to figure out how do you make it right when you do wrong? So 2,000 years before Jesus, there was this guy named Hammurabi. Anybody remember that name, Hammurabi? He's a king, and we remember him because he left a code, a law. Okay, it was called Hammurabi's Code. And in that code, there's famously the phrase, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. You remember this? Okay. Basically, what they're trying to figure out 2,000 years before Jesus is, if somebody messes up, they fall below the standard, how do you make it right? Okay. How do you pay for the sin that they have committed? Okay. But here's the question. How do you pay for lust? How do you pay for lying? How do you pay for adultery? How do you pay if you yell at your kid's little league umpire? right? Uh, How do you pay if you cheat on your taxes? Uh, How do you pay for things like that, right? Like, what is the the penalty? It's not like an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth situation. There's no way to adequately compensate for those things. I don't follow the royal family in the United Kingdom very closely. But maybe you saw recently there was this big to-do about Princess Kate Middleton because she had been out of the public limelight. There was this Photoshop scandal with a picture, and the newspapers in the United Kingdom were just roasting her. Well, then this week, she revealed that she has cancer, and she's been gone because she's getting treatment for cancer. And all those newspapers that had been roasting her are now publishing headlines, we are with you, Kate. Okay, what do they feel? Shame. Okay, because even when we think we're justified in what we're doing, we don't know what we don't know, and often we are getting it wrong. So how do we make those things right that you can't make right? Well, the whole of the Old Testament, we call that the law. And in the law, okay, years before Jesus comes, God the Father says, I'm going to find a way to make it right so that you can be good in my eyes. And the way that God determines to make it right is through blood, the blood of animals, animal sacrifice year in and year out to make up for you and I and our sins. And Hebrews tells us this about that, that the law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. And for this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices of blood, repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. What's he saying? When you read through your Old Testament, you should feel a weariness Because sacrifice all the time for my constant sin, surely I can't keep up. It should make me tired. How many of you are reading the Bible through in a year right now? Yeah, my good buddy here, he came to me last Wednesday night. He said, Eric, I am so ready for the New Testament. You know that feeling? Okay, this is what he's talking about. That vision that God gives us through his old promise of how to make things right should make you long for a better vision. So Jesus, just before he dies, he gets his disciples together and he says this. He says, this cup, holding up wine, says this cup is the new covenant or promise in my blood, which is poured out for you. In other words, God's making a new promise now, still going to use blood, but it's going to be different. Why? It's my blood, my perfect blood. And so we read this about what happens when Jesus dies in Hebrews. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves. He entered the most holy place where sacrifices are made once and for all by his blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. So here's what I want you to picture here is that he has secured by his blood this essentially a pool of eternal justifying blood that can make you confident of your safety in Christ Jesus. There's a new song on the radio by Charity Gale called Thank You, Jesus, for the Blood. Has anybody heard this song? Okay, go look this song up after worship. I'm loving this song, all right? It kind of has Amazing Grace vibes, all right? So it starts with her being a wretch and recognizing she is a wretch, needing the cross and forgiveness of Jesus Christ. And then the chorus goes like this. She says, thank you, Jesus, for the blood applied, the blood applied. Uh, Thank you, Jesus, you have saved my life. She goes on, brought me from darkness into glorious light, she says. And that's the phrase I want to think about because Scripture makes it really clear 
that Jesus through his blood has secured or created this eternal pool of justifying blood, making eternal redemption possible or available to all people, but not all people have received the blood available to them, okay? So let's make a distinction here. There would be a biblical distinction between the blood available to us to justify us and the blood applied to us. Do you understand the difference there? There's a difference between blood available to justify you and blood applied that actually makes you good in God's eyes. And so the question is, when is the blood applied? All right, so buckle up here. I went to lunch with some, some brothers who preach at another church. This is not a church of Christ. And this, this lunch was arranged by a mutual friend and brother here that's, that's close with both of us. So it's myself, a brother from Highland, and then these two preachers of the other church who are some of the best men I know, like godly men. I would love for any of our people to be formed and shaped by them. If my kids were being formed and shaped by them, I would praise God for it. Love these guys so much. So we're getting to know each other. We're making small talk about Little League Baseball in Texas, God's country, and things like that. And then about 20 minutes into the conversation, maybe 30 minutes into the conversation, he sits down on his fork and he says, now tell me what exactly y'all think about baptism, right? And he and I don't see baptism exactly the same way. You know what happened when he said that? Tell me exactly what y'all think about baptism. The brother that had brought us to lunch said, guys, look at the time. I have got to go. <laughs> that is actually true, okay? And... Uh, so he was like, tell me what exactly y'all think about baptism. And I was like, well, have you ever heard of the Panama Canal? And I tried to explain it that way. All right. I had to be here last week for that one. Okay. Um, here's what we left that meeting, that lunch, in agreement on. These three things. These three things we agreed on. Jesus saves me. Jesus saves me. Two, I need to be baptized. And three, my perfect understanding of baptism is not what saves me. That's not what saves me. Okay. So uh, I know that there are those who are baptized as infants and have some kind of confirmation of faith later. I know that there are those who believe that at the moment of their belief they are saved and are baptized later as a confirmation of that. And then there's us, like myself, who believe that actual saving work happens in the water behind me when you confess and believe and are baptized into that water. So we all three see it differently. You might put it like this. If a Catholic, Presbyterian, Lutheran, Baptist, and Church of Christ are walked into a bar, okay, you would be wondering what I am doing in a bar. Okay. We would walk out of the bar um, in agreement on those three things, right? Jesus saves me. I need to be baptized. And my perfect understanding of baptism is not what saves me. And I would acknowledge that there is enough variance in Scripture, okay, that I can understand language or discrepancy about when exactly the Holy Spirit arrives, and the Holy Spirit is the seal that you have been washed in the blood of Jesus, therefore justified and saved. And so the actual metric that we want to look for to determine if somebody is saved is the fruits of the Spirit, okay? whether they have the Spirit at work in their life. And there's enough variance. One of the, the examples that's often used is the thief on the cross. Like, how in the world did Jesus save the thief on the cross if he wasn't baptized? He said, today you'll be with me in paradise. And what I would say to that is if I ever find myself at the foot of the cross, arguing with the man who hangs there for me, telling him who he can save and who he can't save, I'm probably going to be wrong, right? Like, I got to trust Jesus can work those things out. But as a teacher of the gospel, what's incumbent on me is to teach what we believe to be the best explanation of the biblical picture to the question of when is the blood of Jesus applied. So come back with me to Titus and let me show you this. Throw that scripture back up on the screen, Russ, if you don't mind, and let's end like this. Look at this. What we desire is to feel safe. We want the hope of eternal life, the confidence that we're saved. How does that come to us? Well, it comes to us only through the justifying work of the blood of Jesus. You see that? Okay. Hope of eternal life, justified by his grace. So take one more step back. When or how am I justified by his grace? And look what you see. He saves us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. So the clue as to when you are justified only by the blood, therefore securing your safety in Christ is, where are those three things happening at the same time? Washing, 
rebirth, and the giving of the Spirit. And so we follow those clues through the rest of Scripture, and we come to what Jesus says. This is in John 3 when he's talking to Nicodemus. He says this, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they're born of water and spirit. You see it? Born, water, spirit. We see other variations on the formula, like in Acts 2, when Peter tells those who hear him preach, they say, what should we do? And he says, repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Or there's this in 1 John, there are three that testify, the spirit and the water and the blood, and the three are in agreement. Or you could go to Acts 22, where Paul says that he had this vision of Jesus on the Damascus road, but then Ananias came to him and he said, what are you waiting on? Get up, be baptized. Why? For the washing away of your sins. Okay. And so we believe, come with me here to Hebrews 10, this is why I want you to see this, that all of those things are coming together in the waters of baptism that we leave those waters with a deep abiding sense of safety because we believe the blood of Jesus is applied to the believer there. And this is what that means for us. Look at this. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence, that feeling of safety, to enter the most holy place, how? By the blood of Jesus. Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled by blood, to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Okay, the vision of the saved person is one who feels fully safe in Christ Jesus. Okay. Now, um, could God work it out another way? Yeah, he's God. Of course he can, Right? This is the way I think Scripture prescribes to us who desire to feel safe to come to Him and to be justified by His blood in the waters behind me. Can God work it out another way if someone on their way to the baptism dies? Yeah, He can work it out. He's God. There's this great story in 2 Chronicles 30 where Israel's trying to come back to the Lord. They have been messing it up for so long. They've missed Passover. They haven't done their purification rites in so long. And somebody's like, have you all ever heard of Passover? And they're like, what's that? And so they all come together to celebrate Passover, and they're not even purified when they do it, which is a big no-no. And the prophet Hezekiah, he's like, I got to take this to the Lord. And he goes to the Lord, he says, may the Lord who is good, may the Lord who is good pardon everyone who sets their hearts on seeking God, the Lord, the God of their ancestors, even if they are not clean according to the rules of the sanctuary. And I tell you what, look at this. The Lord heard Hezekiah and he healed the people. Okay, that's what I want my attitude to be about this. I want to invite people to the gift that is baptism, the confidence you can have in Christ Jesus because of the blood applied there. But I want to pray for everyone else who sees it differently and trust the Lord is going to work it out. Okay? That's what I want the posture to be. But let me tell you this. Those first two commitments, we believe Jesus saves me and that I need to be baptized. Both of those take faith. And if you believe those, I pray you would be baptized today that the blood of Jesus would be applied to you today. And if you desire that, come see me as we pray and dismiss. Lord, I thank you for these people. I thank you even more so for the blood of your son, Jesus. We pray in his mighty name. Amen. I hope you'll stick around for class, everybody. If you'd like to talk about baptism, come see me down front.
And I'm walking through the valley Your presence is around me Cause nothing stands between me and my God And the fear that was my prison Is no longer where I'm living Cause nothing stands between me and my God There's no place I go that He is not where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we'll be dancing through the darkness, cause we believe it. Every stronghold has to break at the name of Jesus. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. My joy cannot be taken Cause nothing stands between me and my God So I'm looking to Jesus Through a veil that's torn to pieces Cause nothing stands between me and my God No Where the Spirit of the Lord is There is freedom We'll be dancing through the dark Watch the enemy flee Watch the walls come crumbling